All right, so good afternoon to everyone. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present to you the findings of our study about the national level governance for the RBRH law. Okay. So in this presentation, we'll go through this outline. First, uh, a brief refresher on the law and our methods in the study, then our key results, and finally, a synthesis and summary of the recommendations we uh, gave to DOH. But before anything else, I'd like to ask the audience to keep in mind that the study covered the years 2014 to 2019. So it's now the year 2022. Our paper was submitted to DOH in 2021. So it really, um, the DOH and RBRH players have received our recommendations and we're very excited to hear from our discussants later how, how much progress they have made since then, okay? So next slide. So let's start with the background on the law. So RPRH was a landmark law passed in 2012, which presented an important shift in how the Philippine state viewed the role of women, family, and reproductive health, not just in health, not just in the health sector, but also in poverty alleviation in the socioeconomic development of the country. Particularly, it declared that Universal access to reproductive health care services was an instrumental right to life, health, and sustainable development. So the RPRH law covers 12 elements that can be grouped into four thematic area, which I'll just briefly mention from left to right. The first three elements really cover uh, health system capacity and essential services for mothers and their children, so like family planning and nutrition. The second three cover reproductive health services for, and sexuality education for adolescents and youth. And the next three cover reproduct, reproductive tract disorders and diseases such as HIV and AIDS, cancers, and the prevention and treatment of uh, infertility. And lastly, uh, there is an aspect on gender equality and mental health, which affirms men's roles in reproductive health, mental health, and also protection for uh, women and children. Okay. So in our study, uh, the, the, the RPRH law really cuts across sectors. It involves several national agencies, if you read the law, uh, including civil society and even the private sector and multilaterals. The scope of this study, my particular study, is focused on core national agencies mentioned in the RPRH implementing rules. The two presentations after me will cover LGU service delivery and uh, delivery in schools of comprehensive sexuality education. So going back to this study, our scope was notably focused on the national agencies, namely core agencies such as the DOH, the lead implementer of the RPRH law, uh, and who coordinates all the other actors across the nation, PhilHealth, who finances the RPRH services in terms of its benefits packages, Popcom, uh, who was made the co-manager of the National Family Planning Program back then, DSWD, who was charged with the mandate of integrating RPRH into social protection programs, DILG, who, who really is the bridge between the national and the local LGUs, and also uh, supporting agencies such as the Philippine Commission of Women, who has mandates in gender mainstreaming national agencies, the DEPED, who is in charge of integrating RPRH in the curriculums. So to represent also the civil society or the civil society organization, CSOs, we focus then on the on Likaan, interviewing Likaan, who was at that time the secretariat of the CSOs in the national implementation team. And for the donors, we focus on UNFPA, who, who were really heavily involved in providing technical assistance to the national partners at that time, and even today. All right. So overall, this evaluation had the objective to assess whether national governance for RPRH was ex executed cohesively, paying attention to the roles and relationships among the national actors, and also to identify the gaps and challenges in leadership and coordination at the national level. Uh, we define governance here as the exercise of power by RPRH national leaders to manage the implementation uh, and coordinate it strategically to meet the needs of constituents. The evaluation of governance looked particularly into nine components, which is uh, summarized in the figure on the right. The first six, the first box, we looked at six enabling factors. At the center of the enabling factors is really stewardship or the presence of quality leadership to direct the implementation. Uh, this stewardship determines how an agency's, for example, organizational structure, policies, uh, available financing, human resources are allocated or really made responsive, responsive to RPRH mandate. 
Stewardship is also essential to allocating the human resources and coordinating them within agencies and across agencies to carry out mandates. So uh, rallying all these resources allows performance in RPRH, which is the box on the far right, uh, in terms of NGAs fulfilling their mandates for the law. Uh, fulfilling their mandates will theoretically contribute to positive impacts on reproductive health outcomes in the long run. And then in between, the link between performance and enabling factors are really feedback components of accountability and monitoring and evaluation. These will help NGAs improve their operations, decision makings, and hold them answerable to their progress for their mandates. So this is sort of the summary of what we tried to do in this and looked at in this study. Uh, to summarize our method and how we collected our data and analyze it, this study was primarily a qualitative uh, study with three main sources of data. First, key informant interviews with national level respondents in involved in governance across the mentioned agencies a while ago. Second, we reviewed a lot of official documents such as the law, implementing rules, the policies produced by these agencies, accomplishment reports, and even the minutes of the meetings of the national implementation team across the years. These were further verified with literature reviews uh, to check whether what our if our findings were consistent with past studies on governance uh, for laws such as this. And uh, we triangulated all this data with three independent researchers working together to synthesize and arrive at the consensus of results, uh, identifying patterns that we present in the next section and also preventing bias and subjectivity in our interpretations. All right. So now we go on to the meat of our results on the challenges in governance we found. Uh, for reference, if you need to remind yourself about the definition of the components, they are italicized on the upper right corner in case you need to refer back to them. Okay, we can start. For the first one, uh, we look at performance or the accomplishments of the RPRH national implementation team back then, comparing it to the law and implementing rules. Uh, so what we found is, is overall, implementation was really focused on individual programs separately with most of the accomplishments being in family planning and adolescent reproductive health. Overall, there was not really an integration then of interventions into a comprehensive package of RPRH services. And looking at the first box on the left, the RPRH elements with sustained uh, nationwide programs for the National Family Planning Program, Safe Motherhood, HIV AIDS, and the elimination of violence and, against women and children. But these were really investments or programs built on prior uh, investments that based on, for example, Millennium Development Goals, or there was already an anti-violence against women and children law in 2004. So in the middle box, we, we list here the RPRH elements, which received little to no progress at that time, such as the prescription and management of abortion, RH cancers, male responsibility, uh, and mental health aspects of the RPRH law. So on the right, on the last box, uh, this is the summary of uh, when we looked at each line in the implementing rules. Uh, generally, agencies fulfilled mandates that did not require coordination across agencies, such as guidelines, policy standards, and actually most of the things that were accomplished back then was, the, the, was DOH tasks on releasing standards and technical guidelines. And partial accomplishments, these were, these were things that were started back then and effort was being put into them, but they were not completed at the time of the study. So those were mandates with inter with interagency coordinations or even within uh, agency coordinations. An example would be uh, establishing family planning services in establishments which would have required DOH and the DOLE to collaborate. Uh, and the last part, Things that were not done were mostly cross-cutting systems, uh, like putting up monitoring for LGU compliance and integrating the RPRH into curriculums. This was very challenging for the agencies back then because there were really many layers of bureaucracy and then really few channels to coordinate between agencies. So the next one, looking at the responsiveness of uh, national agencies to RPRH mandates, how they changed or I know, uh, folded RPRH into their organizational structures, majority of the NGAs interviewed did not really make formal changes to their structures in response to their mandates. 
but they mostly folded RPRH within existing units that were thematically close. So the trend of not having a focal unit is really understandable in non-DOH agencies, but really was a significant issue within DOH itself. So the RPRH uh, implementing rules section 12.01 mandates a unified family health bureau. But at the time, uh, their attempts to create the bureau since 2015 was really hindered by problems with uh, DBM. DOH tried to consolidate their programs into a women and men's health division and children's health development division, but the responsibility for RPRH was sort of concentrated into, a, into the women's health division because it had, quote unquote, the most programs that referred to RPRH then. So even support functions were, were fragmented across DOH organizational structures. For example, most of the programs are launched, are launched in the DPCB, but uh, things like logistics are lodged in other clusters with different uh, use sex or assets that really made it difficult for them to coordinate. Uh, and, and just last year, however, DPCB had a major restructuring. So maybe we'll hear about that from our discussions, how they were able to sort of move past this bottleneck with DBM. So at the best practice on the right was really in the DSWB, our RPRH was integrated in an existing gender and, develop and development technical working group. So in this sort of structure, multiple bureaus, both program bureaus and supporting bureaus were included in, in the TWG. They were designated focal persons to handle the matter and their process was uh, somewhat expedited because they report directly to the exacom. And, and could skip some part of the chain of command. So this is just a contrast between the DOH and the DSWB. In terms of financing, if you look at the DOH's financing for RPRH back then, it really focused on family planning and maternal health commodities. Looking at the table on the right, table 12 on the top, the largest budget in the DPCB for RPRH was family planning and maternal and child health. 90% of that budget looking at the table 13 at the bottom, was really for vaccines and commodities for nutrition. We, we really had a hard time finding investments and in support infrastructures like information technology, education, advocacy. Uh, and then the, the respondents back then admitted that re they really had limited budget for back-end support systems or inputs to even distribute the commodities. Okay. Moreover, the second point, because family planning procurement is lodged in the DOH, central office, it became very, very vulnerable to political interference. It had been fairly easy to really uh, remove a big chunk of their budget. For example, in 2016, around 200 million pesos was cut from their budget for implants and contraceptives, and again in 2020. And that's why there was sort of a stock out for implants in 2021. Okay. So lastly, across NGAs and within the implementation team, the national implementation team, there is really no unified financial plan. For example, at that time, DepEd did not have dedicated funding for comprehensive sexuality education, which explained why they had so much delays with uh, piloting the program and rolling it out. For national stewardship and coordination, uh, the, the, the national implementation team is supposed to be the interagency body for implementation. Uh, it was created in 2015 to manage and review policy guidelines and coordinate and monitor actions across uh, national actors. However, when we interviewed the, the, national, the NIT members, uh, we, we sort of realized that the NIT did not really fulfill its potential as a venue for the interagency coordination. Among the NGA members, while well, they agreed that it was to be a venue for communication, they were really unclear as to what exactly was to be coordinated. Was it really about policy or operations or even accountability? The lack of clarity uh, was really seen in the NIT meetings because they were focused so much on micro-operational and family planning issues with really little to no discussion and strategy, coordination, cross-national government collaboration. So if you look at the table on the right, you'll see we counted how many of the meetings discussed what aspect. So at the time, uh, 71 of the national meetings uh, we, we, we were able to analyze and more than half of that, they focused on just a few policies reviewing line by line um, and also requesting updates about number of stocks about family planning commodities. Uh, and a lot of these were really something that you could address within agencies outside the NIT or even through emails. So for example, there are a lot of also meetings about 
whether CSOs would be able to access this or that sort of funding, or how about delays and disbursements, sort of like that. Okay. And then the second is the lack of strategic leadership manifested in the absence of a strategic plan or framework to operationalize or institutionalize RPRH within and across NGA implementers. So looking at the table of the right, most, which I mean 57% of the 104 policies we were able to analyze, uh, was developed in 2014 to 2015 by the DOH, and they were really implementing guidelines for its own units or LGUs. While they were there, there were eight policies, internal policies within NGAs to direct their implementation and operations. Most really did not pertain to RPRH mandates as a whole. They were mostly programmatic. At this time, only DepEd actually had the internal policy to institutionalize RPRH, talking about which different units had the role and up to the up to the school level. Um, and also the focus of on family planning, the, the maternal health, and the comprehensive sexuality education in NIT meetings contributed to the absence of other agencies and their decision makers in at NIT meetings. Because without the strategic agenda, uh, agencies who don't really have a clear purpose and benefit in attending NIT meetings uh, would not really want to go there. So in that sense, the other agencies were underutilized and so sort of contributed to the slow progress in implementation of other elements of the RPRH law. Uh, and lastly, for the links between enabling components and performance, we look at the monitoring aspect. So the lack of strategic, strategic plan resulted in unclear, fragmented monitoring frameworks to measure the progress for RPRH implementation. Well, there was an m &E plan developed in 2014. It really emphasized data collection over utilization. Uh, indicators were focused on programs, not really, they were very broad and there was no ownership. There was no theory of change sort of identifying that the, these actions will, will lead to this or these agencies have a role in this aspect. And the, the focus of monitoring was sort of output-based without counting quality. So for example, they'd count how many policies were made, but not whether these policies conform to our peer each uh, implementing rules. Second on the right, the lack of the roadmap, information roadmap really hampered accountability because such a thing leads to self-regulation and weak joint accountability. So on paper, DOH is primarily accountable to the COC and Office of the President. In practice, the accountability of the NIT is self-regulation. Uh, so you can't review progress against the roadmap because there is no roadmap that the Congress or Office of the President can review. Uh, there was not really much ownership and buy-in from other agencies aside from DOH and PopCom and PhilHealth. Uh, because, as I mentioned, the NIT meetings were not really focused on that. They did not uh, sort of take advantage of other sectors being in the NIT. And so the focus of an NGA is really left up to individual agencies, which make, make them prioritize certain key results area or certain RPRH elements that they can understand. Okay, so in this, here I synthesize everything in sort of a timeline, uh, looking at the history in light of what happened to the RPRH law. So in terms of progress, this assessment saw that uh, the RPRH was really just in launch phase in 2019. So uh, we found that RPRH programs, coordinating bodies, and awareness for RPRH within NGAs were still being set up or incomplete. And part of it was the effect of legal battles with the Supreme Court from 2013 to 2017. So starting from the left of the figure in 2012, where the law was passed, it was more or less stalled from 2013 to 2014, then partially from 2016 to 2017. Because after a month uh, where the law was passed, the Supreme Court issued a status quo anti-order that essentially said it, uh, that, that would review if the law was unconstitutional. The order was lifted in 2014, but then again in 2015, there was a temporary restraining order for the DOH procurement of family planning commodities. So though the other elements of the RPRH law were not under the TRO, a lot of the efforts of DOH and POPCOM were focused on lifting the TRO and the FDA were certifying 51 contraceptives. So the, the Supreme Court issues only really ended in November 2017. So it's against this difficult backdrop that the RPRH implementation was launched uh, during the time of this assessment. Uh, hence, it's understandable that 
uh, this phase for them was really about setting up the programs, coordinating bodies, increasing awareness and advocacy. Uh, but overall, still the st strategic approach was really siloed, programmatic, biomedical, focusing too much on commodities. Uh, but during the time of this interview, they themselves, the NIT members, were really aware of this problem and uh, were trying to move forward uh, to address them. So overall, our recommendations for the future was really more about setting up systems for more collaborative governance among multiple sectors and how to start integrating RPRH into national governance and LGU operations. Okay. Uh, this is just a quick summary of our immediate recommendations, immediate, medium, and long-term. Uh, the number one thing we recommend that is that they should really use a holistic framework that goes beyond viewing RPRH as a health sector issue to one that's about population development and rights. For example, this means tackling more structural elements of the RPRH as, uh, such as empowering women and children, uh, education and poverty reduction. So we really wanted them to switch to a system approach in integrating RPRH and not just a family planning centric approach. So our three main points of recommendations were one, immediately maximize strategic oversight in NIT and its members. So each member must understand that RPRH landscape and their role in it, not just like um, attending NIT meetings. And this really means harmonizing the understanding of members to so a roadmap strategic plan uh, that includes but not limited to a comprehensive package of RPRH services, uh, innovations for existing activities, accelerating work on neglected elements, and agency strategies to institutionalize these three. Okay. Medium to long term, it's about mobilizing the national government agencies to uh, finish and actually do their plans, and long term, it's to hold them accountable against the roadmap. Okay. So I think that's everything. Thank you very much. Uh, hand it over back to Mam Sheila. Thank you.